In this video, we'll look at logical connectives, truth tables, and variations of the conditional. So you see here I have a table of the different names for these symbols that we use that represent what we call connectives. And uh, so the negation, we use this tilde symbol. And it's often, it would be written this way. Uh, actually, this is not the only way that it's, some books will use a different symbol. Sometimes some books, some books might use a symbol like that. So you might see negation written uh, this way. So the negation of P uh, is a, has an alternate, depending on the book you happen to be using, uh, or maybe a different website that you're reading. You might see negations written this way. So you say not P. Uh, if you see either of those symbols, this is a symbol for and, or this is the symbol for the conditional, which is often read as an if-then, but they'll, as you'll see, I'll get into different ways in which we could we could say it, and then all sorts of different variations on conditionals. So this is the way it could, would be written symbolically. And then we have if and only if, and also this expression, there are many different ways that we can say it in English, uh, but when you write that one symbol, it has that uh, interpretation in English. It's called the biconditional. So now let's go on to truth tables, looking at uh, how these symbols uh, operate on statements. So this is what we uh, mean by a truth table. We, we are looking at cases for a statement. So this P is like a variable. Uh, it could represent all dogs go to heaven, or some lawyers use logic, or any particular statement uh, to which we can assign a truth value. If that truth value was true, the negation of P would be false. And if the statement was false, the negation would be true. So every truth table lists all of these different cases for all of the variables involved. So this is the truth table for the connective AND, which is also called a conjunction. You can see that AND is only true when both components P and Q, both of those uh, simpler statements are both true, in only that case is the and true. For example, if we say, I went to the movies and I ate popcorn, you could look at I went to the movies as being a statement in and of itself. And when you say, I ate, when you say, when you say ate popcorn here, it, it's understood, I think, in the context of the particular sentence here, that it means the person who's making the statement, that is, I ate popcorn. So that's just the way that we speak. So we could translate that to Q equals, you know, I ate popcorn, because ate popcorn by itself couldn't be true or false, but maybe something like I ate popcorn that may be true or may be false. And so it's only in the case that I actually went to the movies and I actually ate popcorn. If both of those were true, in that one case, the statement that involves the connective and, in that case, it, uh, the and would be true. If, if I went to the movies, didn't eat popcorn, uh, the statement is false. If I didn't go to the movies, but I ate popcorn, statement is false. And if I didn't go to the movies or ate popcorn and both of them were false, then the statement is false. So here's the table for or, and you can see that the truth value or uh, is, is true if either component is true, only false in the case that both P and Q were false. Uh, this is the symbol for or. We can refer to or as being a disjunction. Or is also called a disjunction. So this, this is the disjunction of P with Q. So in a, an example, I went to the movies or I watched a movie on Netflix. Then you've got here, I went to the movies, statement P. Um, it has, it can be assigned a truth value. Watched a movie on Netflix, and I mean, I watched a movie on Netflix. That could be true or false. And if you went to the movies, and you watched a movie on Netflix, if both P and Q were true, then the whole statement is still true. Um, this is what we call the inclusive or. We'll get into the exclusive or later, but right here, uh, this, is, this is the, and when we write this symbol, we mean the inclusive or. Uh, we'll have to create another symbol for the exclusive or. Um, so, 
I went to the movies or I watched Netflix would be true if you went to the movies and didn't watch Netflix or if you didn't go to the movies but you did watch Netflix or if you did both. Only in the case that both P and Q are false, then the whole thing's false. Next, the truth table for the conditional. Uh, what we have here is the four cases where P might be true or false and Q might be true or false and we have listed the truth value of the conditional in each of these cases. You could say that the conditional statement P arrow Q, which another way to say that is to say P implies Q. So P implies Q is true in every case except this one case right here, case two, when P is true and Q is false, in that one case, the conditional is false. Every other case, it's true. And that's kind of interesting um, to look at in, in an example. And I have a, an example that I often go to uh, to explain this one. Think about this truth table and how it applies in this example. Suppose mom says, if you eat your vegetables, then you can have dessert. Now, you eat your vegetables is a simple statement that may be true or false. So let's say you eat your vegetables is P. And then you can have dessert is the statement Q. And suppose that you eat your vegetables is true. And you can have dessert is itself true. Well, then the statement that if you eat your vegetables, then you can have dessert is a true statement. It's kind of, I think, confusing for some people at first to look at something that says if uh, as being either true or false. But it, it sounds reasonable enough that it was no lie that if you eat your vegetables, you can have dessert is true when both of these are true. Now, let's go to the next case. Suppose you eat your vegetables is actually true, but you can have dessert. Let's say that's actually false. So then it was sort of a lie. You're going to say, Mom, you're lying. You said if you eat your vegetables, you can have dessert. And here is a case where we see you eat your vegetables being true and you can have dessert being false. And so it's not difficult to see how that should logically be um, the case where the conditional is false. Now let's take a look at the third case. If you eat your vegetables, then you can have dessert. Suppose that you eat your vegetables, P, that statement is false. You don't eat the vegetables. But Q, you can have dessert. That's actually true. And so the whole statement is actually still true. and. This is a case that we call vacuously true. And it was because if that statement Q is true, it doesn't really matter whether you eat the vegetables or not. It's like mom isn't lying. She says, if you eat your vegetables, you can have dessert. But if it was, if it is separately true that you can have dessert, then it's also true that if you eat your vegetables, you can have dessert. So <laughs> she wasn't lying. Mm -hmm. um, that statement simply has to be true, logically speaking, because it isn't false. <laughs> and that's all there is to it. Okay, and then looking at the last case, it might be a little hard to sort of wrap your head around the idea that a statement that involves an if, a conditional, is itself true or false. I mean, it takes a little while to get used to that, but that's what's happening, and that's what we're working on. And so let's take this last case where both components are false, how do we assign a truth value to the conditional? Well, we'll assign it the value true in this case. And uh, it's, well, you think through here. Suppose you say, if you eat your vegetables, then you can have dessert. You don't eat the vegetables, and you can't have dessert. Well, it is natural and understandable to logically assign the value true to the statement in that case. I think. Uh, it's not that hard to see how that's logically, it makes sense. Uh, and uh, ultimately, another way to look at these is simply how we define the conditional, logically speaking. Uh, this is a logical definition. Um, and so we could have just decided to be whatever we want, but we define it this way 
to match our intuitions as to what it means very strictly logically speaking when we when we use the word if so if you eat your vegetables then you can have dessert is true in the last case if you don't eat the vegetables and you don't uh, get dessert that statement again it's sort of like I, I sometimes I think of it as it must be true logically because it wasn't a lie it wasn't false and in this um, introductory logic Everything must be true or false, one or the other. There's nothing else. Uh, so it's true because it isn't false. Okay, so this is the truth table for the biconditional. And, and b b actually speaking in terms of definitions, this is all of these are definitions. Um, and, and so uh, you can think of it that way. And, and one way that I explain how do you might memorize the definition for the biconditional is that it's true when both the P and Q or whatever components are, are used when they have the same truth value. So in this case, the biconditional is true because these are the same. And in this case, they're the same. It's true. And in these two cases, it's false. Now, this also makes me think about how uh, it's really rather arbitrary as to what order we put these in. I do need to have all four of these cases with two variables. I would have both of them true, one true, the other false, and both of them false, but it was really rather arbitrary what order I wrote that. It's nice to be consistent in the order uh, so that we can uh, compare and, um, well, really to, 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 to compare uh, and, to, and to be more readable, I guess. Um, so, so yeah, this is the um, definition for the biconditional. Um, there's different ways that we could translate that symbol. You might say if and only if. You could write equivalent or logically equivalent. Is equivalent to or is logically equivalent to. There's another symbol that we use for logically equivalent that is these three arrows, Where I mean these three lines. Wherever you write the three lines, you could also write the two arrows. They are the same thing. But I choose to use this symbol because I have another thing that I want to write that just, it's more natural to write this way. To, it just, it's a common way to write it. So I'll say P if and only if Q, uh, yeah, P if and only if Q is logically equivalent to, the point I'm trying to make is where it gets the name is it's the same as saying P implies Q and Q implies P. So we can go through and do a truth table for this whole compound statement, and it comes out the same as what we've defined this, this biconditional symbol to be. Uh, so I want to do that in a minute, but, um, but I thought I would say that uh, this, this here. I guess the thing is that if I was to use the double arrow again with this statement, I'd have to bring in these extra grouping symbols to make it precisely correct logically. Uh, this um, statement, P if and only if Q, is logically the same as if P then Q and if Q then P. Uh, and uh, what's happening here is that I need to start looking at more complicated truth tables and talking about logical equivalence. And so um, I think we'll, we'll do that next. Let's take a look at the following equivalents. Let's show that P or P and Q is logically equivalent to just the statement P. So we'll do that by creating a truth table that includes every possibility for P and Q. Now to get the truth value for this entire compound statement, I'll follow the rule for AND first, because once I know the truth value for this compound statement, I can get the truth value for the larger compound statement. So I need to follow the rule for AND for the conjunction. So the rule for AND is it's true when both P and Q are true. So here we get true. Here this one is false, false, false. This is AND, so it's true only in the case that both of the components are true. Now I can get a truth value for the full compound statement. What we need to do now is use the rule for the disjunction for OR between columns 1 and column 3. 
So if you do an OR with columns 1 and 3, remember the rule for OR is it's true as long as either of the components is true, or if they were both true. In this case, it's true. Here, one of them is true. Uh, here, neither of them is true, since neither are true. Neither columns 1 or 3 is true, so this is false. And here, again, they're both false, so the OR is false. And of course now I can see that the truth value for this statement is exactly the same as the truth value for P, and therefore uh, I've shown these are equivalent. Let's take a look at some variations of the conditional. This is not the whole story, it's just the beginning. We're going to come back to this in another video, but the first step is, is just the, what I've laid out here. Uh, given a conditional, uh, if P then Q, uh, you can talk about the first part of the conditional as the antecedent and the last part as the consequent. And so when you form the converse of a conditional, you switch the antecedent and consequent. The inverse, you'll just negate the antecedent and negate the consequent. And then finally a contrapositive, we both switch antecedent and consequent and negate them. So as an example, I have, if you take the medicine, then you will feel better. Let's say that's P you will feel better. That's Q. So a converse, I'll write, if you feel better, then you took the medicine. Now I am changing the tense uh, because I'm just choosing to not distinguish logically between past and future tense or present tense. And it's just, I think, in the context or in this, uh, it's it's uh, it's useful in this situation to, to not distinguish between those. Um, that is, I'm just sort of choosing not to distinguish logically between you will feel better or you feel better or you take the medicine or you took the medicine, uh, making no distinction, logically speaking, between those uh, in this particular example. So that's the converse, switching antecedent and consequent. And here now the inverse is, uh, if you don't take the medicine, then you won't feel better. So I just negated, but left everything in the same order. And finally, contrapositive, if you don't feel better, then you didn't take the medicine. Now, an important thing to recognize about converse and inverse and contrapositives of a given conditional is uh, whether or not they are equivalent to the given conditional, so, or to each other. So uh, I've written out here the truth table for the original conditional, P implies Q, and its converse, Q implies P, and you can see that the truth table doesn't come out the same in every case. The value, the truth value of that conditional, Q implies P, isn't the same in every case as P implies Q. It is the same truth value in some cases, but not every case, and so we say that the converse is not equivalent to um, the given conditional. And I'm looking at the inverse, I need to create a column for the negation of P and a column for the negation of Q. And then I can use the rule for the conditional, uh, which is true in every case except for this one case. And here it is, true to false in that particular order. Uh, that's the place where it came out false. So I could see that the inverse doesn't have the same truth value in every case as the conditional. But then the contrapositive, well, it does have exactly the same truth value as the original conditional. The original conditional was true, false, true, true. True, false, true, true. So after completing a truth table for the contrapositive of P implies Q, I have the truth value of that contrapositive is the same in every case. And therefore, I could say that the contrapositive is always going to be logically equivalent to the given conditional from which the contrapositive was formed. You might have noticed that the converse and inverse are equivalent to each other. Now, how could that be? Why is it that the converse and inverse are equal to each other? They are not equal or logically the same as the original, but they're equal to each other. And that is because, actually, they are contrapositives of each other. If you 
reverse antecedent and consequent and negate, you get this and vice versa. So converse and inverse are equal to each other, but not to the given. The given is equivalent to the contrapositive. Okay, let's take a look at some other uh, commonly used, some other statements that we will use a lot um, and, uh, and list, list that out. Okay, so let's look at a list here of some important logical equivalencies that we will encounter very often. Uh, this list could go on and on, but I'll start with just these six. Uh, these would certainly be worth memorizing. There may be a few more that we'll want to add to the list later, but um, beginning here, this, this will be enough to, to get us a good start. Um, the negation of P or Q is equivalent to negation P and negation Q. Negation P and Q is negation P or negation Q. This is, these two together are called de Morgan's laws. The statement P implies Q is logically the same as not P or Q, and P or Q is logically equivalent to not P implies Q. I don't really have a special name for this. I would just say the equivalence between conditionals and disjunctions. You could do a truth table for both of these and recognize that in every case, uh, the truth value in every case is the same. That is, of course, with all of these, I'm just pointing out how an, an or, a disjunction, can turn into a conditional and vice versa. This number five on my list is uh, the negation of a conditional. And the last one on there is just the contrapositive we could call it a contrapositive rule. So let's, let's look at the truth table for the conditional P implies Q and compare that with P and not Q. You see that the truth value is exactly the opposite in every case. And so that's why P and not Q is a negation for P implies Q. That's one of my rules that I put here the negation of the conditional, number five, the negation of P implies Q is P and not Q. That is, P and not Q is a negation of this guy. Another thing I could point out is a truth table for not P or Q is exactly the same as the truth table for P implies Q. It's This disjunction is the same as the conditional and it illustrates how these are logically equivalent statements. Let's look at some examples. We'll start with De Morgan's Law, De Morgan's Laws. So I have a statement here, I will cut my hair or wear a hat. And so this is a statement that has the form P or Q. And so when I want to negate that, the negation of P or Q it is the same as having negation P and negation Q. That's the statement I have here. I will not cut my hair and I will not wear a hat. This is negation P and negation Q. Another example, some people think I'm crazy and I don't care. So the negation would be negation by De Morgan's Law. This statement, some people think I'm crazy. That's P, I don't care. That's Q. And again, I now have, actually I want to use a slight variation on the rule. The other of the De Morgan's Laws is the negation of P and Q. So a negation of that, not P or not Q. And so you notice this is an example where I had to do the negation of a quantified statement. Some people think I'm crazy. Negation is no one thinks I'm crazy. That's negation P. Or, because I'm following this rule, I do care, the negation of, of Q. One last example there. No one knows the truth or everything we were told is a lie. Since this is an or and I want to negate it, I'm going to find the answer to have an and, which is right there. The negation of no one knows the truth is someone knows the truth, or at least one person knows the truth. 
and negating everything we're told is a lie. The negation is some things we were told are not lies. Now we can look at some examples that uh, move between conditionals and disjunctions. So the rules that I'm using are either, well, that you could write negation P or Q as P implies Q. And you can write, well, this is basically the rule, but I, I often write it in two different ways. So one way to write it is starting with a conditional, then you negate the first part, change it to an or. And if you started with an or, you can write it as a conditional by negating the first part. That's one way that I've sort of memorized the rule for myself. This is also uh, the same rule, just writing it another way. So if you eat something, then you see it. So this is P. You see it. That's Q. You don't eat something. That's negation P or Q. Right? Another example, if you live in Philadelphia, then you live in Pennsylvania. So this is P. You live in Pennsylvania, that's Q. So an equivalent f statement as a disjunction is you don't live in Philadelphia or you live in Pennsylvania. So these are some examples of just turning uh, or statements, disjunctions into conditionals. You miss the bus or you make it to class is equivalent to, if you don't miss the bus, then you make it to class. Some people are speeding, or no one is in traffic court. Some people are speeding is a quantified statement. There's P. No one is in traffic court, also a quantified uh, statement. And to write it as a conditional, the equivalent conditional would be if and then I have to negate some people are speeding, so I get no one is speeding. Then no one is in traffic court. See, I'm not negating this part. That's because I'm using the rule that an or statement is equivalent to a disjunction, but only if you write it this way. All right, let's finish with forming negations of conditionals. And the rule that I'm following is this. Negating P implies Q is equivalent to the statement P and not Q. First example, if everyone cheats on taxes, then government will fail. So we'll break this up into, this is the statement P, everyone cheats on taxes, true or false. Government will fail. Another simple statement that could be true or false. And so the negation is P and not Q. All right, there's something really difficult with the negations of conditionals. It's a very common mistake to keep uh, the word if when you form a negation. Um, it's often, it'll turn into the in inverse, and in the inverse is not the negation. So to really, truly create the opposite truth value, you have to form this statement, P and not Q, if you're negating a conditional. So here's another example. If there are criminals, then jails are needed. So to form the negation, there are criminals, that's P. Jails are needed, that's Q. We have a statement, if P, then Q. So the negation would be P and not Q. And finally, the last example on here, if you take the medicine, then you will feel better. The negation is you take the medicine and you don't feel better. You see how this is really contradicting uh, the conditional statement. If the conditional statement were in fact true, then this would be false. But if it was that the, the you could say the only way in which the conditional is false is when the first part is true and the second part is false. That is, imagine you took the medicine and you don't feel better. Maybe just one last thing to point out how, how another way that we can see why is it that the negation of the conditional 
is an and statement. Um, P and not Q. Well, we can connect it to something we already established, and that is that a conditional can be written as an or. So we could say the negation of P implies Q is equivalent to the negation of negation of P or Q. And here I'm using a rule that the conditional can be written as a disjunction. But then if I negate uh, this disjunction by De Morgan's law, I have the negation of the negation of P and the negation of Q. And then the negation of the negation of P is just P. So we're left with P and not Q. So that confirms our sort of algebraic way of seeing it that negating a conditional isn't going to be a conditional anymore. It's actually going to be this uh, conjunction, P and not Q. All right, I think I'll stop with the video at this point. Hope it's been a helpful video.